Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. If you're like a lot of woodworkers, you're probably finding yourself migrating more and more towards hand tools. If this is the type of thing that you'd like to be able to do, and I might add, the nice thing about doing things like this by hand, you really get to show off your craftsmanship. If you're doing this with a jig, it's not all you, right? When you're doing this by hand, it's all you. So at the end of every class I teach, whether it's a, a one-day class or a five-day class, students always like to ask my opinion on what I think would be the best purchase for hand tools. Well, I put together what I call my top 10 list. It's not the only tools you're going to need, but it is where I would spend my money on purchasing my first top 10 group of hand tools. Now, I'm only including things that typically cost more than $100. The other small bits and pieces you can pick up as time goes by, but these are critical. I'm going to start over here on my left and I work my way across the bench. First is your sharpening gear. This is what makes all the rest of these tools work. This is where you need to spend the money and get the very best you can buy. Now I've searched and I've come up with this as I think the best system for producing the best edge in the quickest amount of time at the least amount of cost. And I must admit that the cost is the last thing on my criteria because I'm willing to spend if I'm going to get the performance. I start with a product called a Trend Diamond Plate. This is a double-sided plate. It's got a 1,000 grit side and a 300 grit side on the, other, on the other side. This is what I start with. I finish with a ceramic 16,000 grit stone made by Shapton. And this has to be kept flat. So before every use, I spend three to five seconds using the 300 grit side of the diamond plate to keep this one nice and flat. Now my sharpening of both chisels and planes simply start here and finish here. The only reason I have a third stone is when you initially buy your chisels you've got to go through and prepare the backs and that surface area is large enough that you can't simply start with 1000 and finish with 16. Like sanding you need to go through a progression of grits so I add at least one more stone in there which would be a 6000 grit stone. Afterwards you're not going to use this you're only going to use your 1000 and your 16 to do the edge and maintain the edge. So purchase number one, and I realize it's three products, but I would consider this one group, so this is your first. Second, <clears throat> that's going to be the plane that I use the most. And in my case, it's my five and a half. It's made by a company called Wood River, and I had a hand in actually designing these. Uh, in fact, I sell them in Canada as well, so there's obviously some bias here. But most of the times that this gets reviewed, it always comes away with the best value award because... It will produce as good a surface on the board as any other plane will, minus some of the superfluous stuff. And it's the superfluous stuff that costs so much. So this is probably the least expensive five and a half that you're going to get where you actually will find the performance right out of the box. Why do I like it? Well, it's long enough and heavy enough to be really effective on a shooting board, and yet it's small and manageable enough to be very good as a general purpose on the bench. And I like to have that one, those two factors built into one tool. Next purchase would be my chisels. And there's six of them sitting here. I'll, let me explain. These are beveled edge, meaning that they have clearance on the side so that when you're doing something like chopping dovetails, you can actually get in between the tails without bruising either side. These are made by a company called IBC in Toronto, Canada. And I actually was involved in the design of these as well. And I sell them, so again, I'm stating my bias. I think there's three sizes that you can manage with, quarter inch, half, and three quarter. What's really nice about these chisels, not only do they come with incredibly good steel, but you can actually remove the handle, remove the ferrule, and that will lay flat on your stone so when in the initial preparation phase, there's nothing to get in the way. The other nice thing about it is you can do whatever you want for handles. If you want to make your own, you can turn them on the lathe, you can make them out of pine and have really light handles, or you can use any hardwood, no matter how fancy it is. You don't ever actually hit the wood. You're hitting the aluminum cap, which has a connector inside that screws onto the end of the actual chisel itself. Simply take it out, put it in a new handle, and away you go. Give it a good uh, snugging up, and it's all set. So these are my beveled edge chisels. But if you're going to do some handwork, and like again, I said, it's nice to be able to show off your skill, you're going to want to cut those mortises by hand. It's a heck of a lot easier than it looks, and it's a heck of a lot easier than setting up the machines to do it. I would have three, quarter, three-eighths, and half. These are Lee Nelson's. I think they may currently make the best mortise chisels. They're square in cross-section. That means they are as tall as they are wide. That helps when you're chopping it in the wood to prevent it from twisting. 
if you were to try to do that with a beveled edge chisel where there's very little reference surface on the side, it wants to follow the grain sometimes and it's very difficult to keep it nice and true, whereas the wide sides help to do that. Next would be my number seven jointer. Now, why a big plane like this? Well, the long sole in the jointer helps you when it comes to flattening a surface or straightening an edge. That long sole will ref reference off of the high spots and help you bring it down to one level. Still requires skill by the user, but less skill required using a long plane than a shorter plane to do that kind of a job. This too is a Wood River, great value for the money. You can spend a whole lot more, but you're really not going to improve the performance. Next is going to be a shoulder plane. Now this is a must have because it will do something that none of the other planes will do. If you look at any bench plane, the blade does not go to either side. It stops short. If you're going to do something like adjust the shoulder on a tenon, you have to be able to work right into the vertical surface, and that's allowed with a shoulder plane. This is a three-quarter. It'll cover almost any, any um, task you're going to have in building house furniture, whether you're working with three-quarter stock, where your shoulder would end up being a quarter of an inch wide, or inch and a half stock where your shoulder is going to be a half an inch wide. You still have all of that covered in three quarter capacity. I also like this. When they designed this, they patterned it after an old Preston. And the lever cap is actually hollowed out on the underside, which allows you to put your fingers underneath there. And squeezing it like this, you have lots of control. I also like the fact that the lever cap is down low, so you're really behind the blade instead of sipping, sitting up on top of it. Really nice plane, really good value. Next is a block plane. Now this is a one-handed plane, and it's very difficult to cut a chamfer on something if you're trying to balance a big five and a half. That's one of the areas where you really want a low angle plane, or pardon me, a block plane, and in this case, a low angle. Now let me explain that. If you remove the lever cap, and I must admit, I really like this style of lever cap. When it comes to adjusting the blade, it's a lot easier to remove the tension first. On some plane, that means re re uh, re unspinning a, a uh, large adjustment knob and then trying to bring it back to the exact same spot. On this one, you simply pop the lever cap, but have enough pressure on there that the parts don't fall out on you. You can go ahead and make your adjustment and then snap that back into place and you're good to go. Now, a little more explanation on this. If you remove the lever cap, you'll notice that the blade on a block plane has the bevel on the top side. So when you're calculating the angle that you're actually planing the wood, you have to take into consideration the bedding angle, which in this plane is 12 degrees, and then whatever bevels you have on the blade, the primary bevel, which is usually 25 degrees, and most folks sharpen with at least one, if not two, micro bevels, which could add anywhere from three to as many as six extra degrees. So that plane is actually meeting the wood at 12 plus 25 plus six, you're planing at 43 degrees. A standard angle plane, you start at 20 degrees, so you're up an additional eight which means now you're planing <clears throat> at 51 degrees, which is quite high. What I really like about the low angle approach is if you want a higher angle, you can simply buy a second blade and put steeper bevels on it. But if you notice when this is in place and you put the lever cap in, the distance from the top of the lever cap to where you would hold your thumb and finger in these little recesses is much lower. So it nestles in your palm much nicer than having it sitting up here, that extra eight degrees. I really prefer the low angle. This is the one I recommend. This one also has an adjustable throat, so if you loosen that knob, the lever allows you to move that toe plate either closer to or away from the blade. Closer to to help hold fibers in place when the grain is reversing, away from when you want to take a heavy cut and you don't want to be encumbered by too tight of a throat, which would limit the amount of material you could remove at any given time. Next group is going to be your saws. A little bit of shameless promotion here since I make these, but these saws will allow you to get very good at whatever operation you're doing in the fact that the saw is going to give you all the advantages that you could possibly get built into the tool. First, the dovetail saw. You want a saw that has a pistol grip for the simple reason that you know, after a short amount of time, it's going to register this. It will reg Actually, it will register in your hand the same way every time you pick it up. After a short amount of time of doing it, you're going to get a feel for where plumb is and where those angles are, particularly when cutting dovetails. Uh, my blade is fairly shallow. You're never making a very deep cut when cutting dovetails. So the closer the tooth line is to the heavy brass back, the more stable it's going to be in use. 
Starting the cut is the most important aspect, and I use a little wee tiny 22 teeth per inch up at the front, the first two inches, and the cutting face is negative 30 degrees, which means it almost just rides over the wood and does the one function you want, which is to simply start a very light groove exactly where you want the cut to be. When you then move to the heavier 15 teeth per inch, that's where it gets aggressive and it cuts very fast. Great saw. It's proven itself over time. Next saw that I would have would be a cross cut. Now they look very similar except the tooth configuration. This has a rip tooth. This is cross cutting designed specifically for going across the grain. Where would you use this? Most notably you would use it when cutting off the cheeks to create the shoulder on the tenon portion of a mortise and tenon joint. And it's that shoulder that you're going to see when the joint is assembled. How it meets the face of the board that has the mortise in it is going to determine the overall look of the joint. Well, my teeth have just two thousandths of an inch set per side, so not only does it cut very straight, but that produces a very flat surface, which is very easy to join to. All the other features are the same. And finally, a tenon saw. When you're making that deep cut on creating the tenon, you need the capacity that is allowed with a larger tooth, so we have 12 teeth per inch, that will, those gullets are deeper, they will clear the sawdust faster and keep your saw cutting. This one too has the little starter teeth up front so that you can get it going with accuracy. You've got uh, almost two inches of depth of cut underneath the brass back. So when you're talking about house furniture, that's pretty much going to fill all your needs. Next group of tools are your marking gauges. Actually, this is a marking gauge, this is a mortising gauge. Now this tool I consider to be second only in importance in doing something like uh, cutting a dovetail. The reason is what the marking gauge does becomes part of the finished joint. And you want a marking gauge that will cut through that wood and leave a very precise line that is easy to register your chisel in and gives you a nice clean mating surface when the second part of the joint comes up against that. So my cutters are very sharp. I have a flat spot to prevent that from rolling off on the bench and I have a large locking knob that makes it nice and secure. Now in addition to your marking gauge, you need a mortising gauge. This is the tool that you use to transfer the size of the mortise chisel to the, port, to the part that you're going to cut the mortise in and also helps in laying out the actual tenon. So the way you would do it, take your mortise chisel, re loosen that brass thumb screw, open up the large cutter, set the mortise chisel in, squeeze the large, thread the large cutter until it squeezes the chisel between the two cutters, come in and tighten up with the brass thumb screw, remove that, and now you've got the exact width of your chisel, which is the gauge for the entire joint. You can lay out your tenon with that, you can also lay out your mortise, and you're not having to interpret between two different settings, that one setting does both, and that improves your accuracy by limiting the amount of times you have that you can screw up. Number nine, would be this little tool. This is called a router plane. It's made by Lee Nelson. I love this. It's extremely accurate. It's a very simple tool, but when it comes to adjusting something like a tenon, you can do that with the accuracy that you cannot match with any other tool. You simply reduce the uh, thumb screw, set the cutter for whatever depth you want, lock it. And what's really nice about this, if you'll notice, that the locking knob pushes on the corner, which drives that little chisel into that opposite corner, very secure, nice and tight, great tool. Not terribly expensive, but fantastic, extremely accurate. Oh, by the way, what I also like about this, unlike the large router plane, the support of the flat part of the sole is very close to the blade, and I just find that to be invaluable when you're doing something like adjusting the thickness of a tenon. Now the final this too is a Lee Nelson product. This is the skew block plane. It was patterned after the Stanley number 140. It has a removable side plate, which allows the blade to be worked right up to a vertical surface. The blade is at an angle, hence the term the skew. It has an adjustable fence, so you loosen the locking knob, move your fence wherever you need it. When you lock that in, when you're cutting a rabbit along the edge of a board, the skew, blade, skew of the blade actually pulls the tool this way Keeping the fence nice and tight makes for a very precise cut. I use this when cutting dovetails, and I wouldn't want to be without it. Great tool. These are my top ten. Like I said in the beginning, if you're planning to combine hand tools with power tools, 
by using tools like this, you get to show off those parts of your furniture that are highly visible, like a dovetail joint. I, uh, I realize that there's a lot of other tools that you're going to need. There's marking tools. There's mallets. You can pick those up along the way. This is where you're going to spend the majority of your money. This is where you're going to get the biggest payback for the dollars that are spent. I hope this helps. And good luck with your woodwork.